We are live. All right, Bill, it's all yours. Hey, guys. All right. Thanks for joining us today. We're hey. going to discuss shift tactics number nine, creating buyer eight, uh, urgency to buy. I did put in the comments section a link so that you can access the course material if you so choose. There's a, um, a PowerPoint as well as a PDF. I think the PDF might be a little easier to follow along with, but it's whatever you guys want to do, whatever you're comfortable with. All right. Bill, you said the comment section or the chat? Or the chat? The chat. Yeah, the chat. Yep. Thank yeah, you. it's there, Ruben. Thank you. Sure. So, you know, what, what we're talking about is what is a shift? And really, this book, um, it, it's extremely timely because of where we're at right now. Uh, there is some uncertainty, not just from the public perspective, but also from us as agents, not knowing um, are we going to be able to continue at the same pace that we have been over the last seven years, eight years, um, that the market has been really, really good, right? Um, if anybody was around back in 2005, six, seven, all fantastic years, um, everybody was killing it. You know, 2008, 2009 came around and, and things were um, different. What's different this time, though, is that we don't see the world crumbling around us. Yeah, we, we're experiencing a little bit of a hiccup with, with what's going on with uh, COVID. And people have lost their jobs. Those jobs are going to come back. It may take a little bit of time. What the important thing is, is shift, right? Um, and what this book is about. And shift means so many different things. You know, you, you've got a car. Um, when you're stuck in first gear, you can only go so fast. So what do you do? You shift gears, you can get a little bit faster. And that's what we have to do. We have to shift not only the gears, the gears of our mentality. So sometimes you have to double down, triple down, and know what you're talking about. You want to be the economist of choice. I know David has said that a million times. The book shift references that exact uh, terminology many times. Uh, when, well, he helped write it. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what a shift means is not only are you changing gears, but you're changing course. You're changing your mindset. And when you change your mindset, you want to make sure that you're, you're feeding yourself with positive, positive thoughts. Um, it can be self-affirmation. Uh, it could be, instead of looking at how many houses you sold last year, you set your goals and, and you maybe adjust your goals, but still staying realistic. One thing that I was thinking about when I was reading this was things that shift around us and how we change with those, with those shifts. And one of the, the, the best um, things that came to mind was you're flying a kite and the wind shifts. When that wind shifts, you shift with it so that kite stays up in the air, right? If you don't, that, can't, that kite's gonna come crashing down. So it's important that we always keep an eye on the wind. Keep that wind at your back so that you don't have headwinds, you've got tailwinds pushing you forward. Um, when we talk about creating um, your, your buyer urgency, it can be counter, uh, counterintuitive what you would consider a buyer's market thing about when you when you have uh, and, and this is true in the stock market and in the housing market when when you see stock prices or housing prices that are escalating beyond belief at a, at a clip of 10 percent per year 15 percent five percent whatever it is uh, all of a sudden there's this there's this crazy urgency where everybody wants to jump in the market and think that they're getting a great deal because so many other people are, are doing the same thing and you have a fear of missing out. But the reality is the best time to buy is really not even in this market, but somewhere in between, right? So if you have a market that is going up, 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 or down, 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 you definitely want to try and stay in that, that curve. At some point, if things continue the way we're going, we're probably gonna, gonna, gonna run into um, a little buyer resistance and that's gonna be normal and it's probably gonna be healthy. What ends up happening in a buyer's market because there's so much inventory um, and because of what the media is telling people is that 
there's a fear of paying too much. Is the market going to continue to its, its downward spiral? Um, when's the bottom going to hit? If I buy today, am I going to find a better deal in five weeks, next week, tomorrow? One good thing that you can do, though, is just take a piece of paper, right? And show your buyers and say, look, this is the market. And it's going down, down, down. Now tell me where to stop. Anybody, tell me where to stop. Stop right there. Stop. Okay. Stop right there. Okay. So what happens if you already missed that? Right? Nobody can, can tell you where the buyers, where, where the end of this a down market is going to be. And I'm not saying we're, we're in a down, mar down market right now, because if you look at the statistics, we definitely are not in a down market right now. Uh, we're, we're still averaging 45 to 65 uh, new listings a day and something like 70 are going under contract. It's, it's, it's actually still pretty insane. But again, um, at some point down the road, there, there's a strong possibility that we are going to, you know, experience potentially uh, uh, some, some lower, you know, some uh, prices that are coming down. So right now, it's, it's kind of hard to say that, you know, buyers are going to be reluctant because of prices falling, because we're not experiencing that yet. Um, but the, the main outline still applies. Basically, our buyers going to be at some point scared that they're going to be paying too much on something. Um, and, and that's why I wanted to bring that, you know, that, that little down drawing, because nobody's going to ever be able to time the bottom, just like in the stock market. When there's a ton of inventory, which we're not experiencing right now, but when that time comes, when there's a ton of inventory and there's only a handful of buyers, there's a lot of things that happen. Uh, you, you, have, you get paralyzed by the amount of options. It's just like going into, the, into a grocery store. And you know you used to be able to, and, and I'm, I'm going to you know quote from the book. Um, you know you you go into a grocery store, and there used to be three selections of jelly, and you're like, okay, well I like grape jelly, and I'm going to get the Concord brand. Now you walk into the grocery store, and there's 30 different variations. There's different brands. There's different flavors. There's um, non-GMO. There's uh, or with sugar. There's uh, no no uh, um, high fructose corn syrup. It, you stand in front of that jelly aisle, man, I mean, I don't know how anybody can go grocery shopping and not take two hours because of the paralysis of trying to make a decision on something. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because, and, and I might be jumping a little ahead of myself, but one thing that you're going to, that, that you want to make yourself um, attuned to is know the market. And this should be in every market. I shouldn't have to tell you this as just from a, in a buyer's market perspective or to create buyer urgency, but for you to become the true professional that, that you can be, you need to study. You need to look at the MLS on a daily basis. Once you've got the, memo, the, the MLS down pat, I even recommend going outside of the MLS and looking at some of our competitors' websites. And when I say competitor, I'm, I'm specifically pointing out Zillow. Um, not everything that's on Zillow makes it to the MLS. Uh, so you want to, to look at every possible angle for the best deals. And the reason you want the best deals is because you want to be able to show the best options for, uh, to, your, to your buyer clients. How do you do that? Well, the first thing you want to do is a buyer consultation. You have a conversation with your buyers, write it down. Have, have a, 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 an earnest conversation. The number one thing that you're going to talk about besides the location is what their budget is, because that is going to really help you narrow down things first and foremost, because if someone just says, hey, I want to live in Highland, I want to live in Munster, and I need three bedrooms. Um, yeah, that's great. If you just do that simple search, you know, you're going to come up with, let's say, 80 listings. But when you start narrowing things down, now I need to have a two-car garage. I need to have three bedrooms. I need to have a second bathroom. Um, always have a list of what their wants are and what their absolute bottom line needs are and why. Hey, Bill. Yes. I want to chime in on this too because when I Great. first got into business, I, I nobody taught me that what a buyer consultation was or how to do one or anything. And it seemed like every buyer took six months. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, with having too many choices and, and, and not feeling comfortable knowing what the right house is when they see it, they always hesitate. They always want to second guess and let's see other properties and they just, they spin in circles. Um, so we have found 
dramatically different results by doing the market education piece, getting them to sign an agency agreement, and then going deep on the needs analysis at the consultation. Um, and we use the, the buyer consultation template from Sean Kokoska, which um, I will, I'll go grab the link and put it in the comments. You buy it, but then you've got it. You can modify it. We use that. Um, it's amazing. But here's the thing that I learned recently because we're having, we're working with all of our top agents doing a buyer urgency analysis where, you know, what did this, what really is there? Like, is this person going to buy right now or not? Yes. Uh, and, and they'll say, Oh, I'm ready and all this stuff. But here's the question that I, I wanted to add that, that we're starting to ask. And I think is critical. What happens if you have not closed on a home in the next 60 days? Because here, our average contract to close is about 46 to 49 days. So, you know, two weeks to write a contract, to find a home, write a contract, another month and a half to close. What happens if you've not closed in 60 days? And if their answer is anything that's not painful, they're not an A buyer. Yeah, right. And your, your, your consultation is really the best opportunity to do that, where you got them face to face. You're not in the middle of, a, you know, a house and they're distracted. And you go, what? What really happens for you if 60 days from now you haven't closed on a home? You're like, I'm okay with that. Or I wasn't 60 days. I was thinking six months. You know, like if it's anything other than that can't happen, you've got a B or a C buyer. That's okay, but you need to know. Like right now, you really need to know who's an A buyer and who's not. Absolutely, Alex. You know, and, and, and you know, continuing with that is, you know, you don't necessarily want to spend your time showing buyers houses just so that you can say that you've got clients, that you've got customers that you're showing houses to. Don't and mistake your business, movement for achievement. Right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and that's so counterproductive. And I'm glad that you brought that up because I was the same way. And I was, I, I was always the type of agent when I first got in the business that as soon as that phone rang, I was out the door. My wife had no idea when I was coming, when I was going. Um, she hated me being a realtor. Absolutely hated it. Because she's like, you've got no rhyme, no reason. Someone calls you and you're out the door. You don't go off a schedule. Um, you know, and, and I'm working on that, Alex, I promise. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I have changed. I know you are. Yeah, man. But, but I have changed my perspective. And, and I, you know, you still want to serve your clients the best you can. And, and, and in a strong seller's market, sometimes you have to bend. Um, but I mean, if it's someone you've got an established relationship with, um, you know, you're definitely going to make every effort possible to get them that house so you don't lose it. But of course, you know, we're talking about buyer urgency from, from a different perspective. So, you know, we have, again, we, we haven't seen much of a shift as far as prices goes. And, and I don't, I'm not even going to say that we're going to, um, it could happen. If it does happen, what you definitely want to do is instead of have that, uh, creating all that, that paralysis, because they're spending their nights and weekends on, on KW's website or on Zillow or on homes.com or wherever it is that they're, that they're doing their searching. Um, the, the biggest thing about, about starting that, that uh, having that buyer consultation is to say, listen, you don't need to waste your time and, uh, and, and your mind because it's, it's mentally exhausting as well, searching for properties that you have no zero, zero interest in. When you do that buyer consultation with them, it not only educates you, but it educates them as well. It shows them that, hey, this is really what I need. Why am I looking for a two bedroom, one bath house in an area that I don't even want to live in because it came up in my search because I based it off of one uh, set of criteria. Definitely you want to listen to what your buyers have to say. And when you listen to what they have to say, that allows you to fine tune what, um, what kind of properties you're going to show them or send to them. I started talking about mindset and I, and I kind of jumped off track a little bit. And one thing you want to make sure is that when you do experience a shift in the marketplace, that it's your mindset that stays positive because you create the energy that your clients are going to feed off of. If you come in and say, Hey, you know what, uh, the way the market is right now, I wouldn't blame you for not buying when the truth really is there's houses selling in every market. In 2009, when, when there was you know, uh, 50 new listings, 60, 100 new listings coming on the market and only seven buyers, um, you know, they, those houses, there were still houses selling. And what the thing is, is that it was the best houses that were selling. It was the ones that were priced where they were supposed to be condition-wise and location-wise. So just because there was 50 houses in, in, a, in a particular town, um, it doesn't necessarily mean you wanna go show them all 50 of those houses. 
you want to create a buyer's list, uh, a list of properties that are going to hit every one of those details or as close to that list that they provided to you as possible. Now, maybe you do that and you only come up with two houses. Hey, that's fantastic. You share that with them and you go and you set up an appointment with those two houses and you walk through. And if the buyers at that point decide that they need to make some changes to their wish list, their needs list, that's something that, again, you guys can do together and you have a conversation about why. But again, the most important thing when you're working with your buyers is keeping a positive mindset, no matter what. You know, there's some stats from, from different years. Um, 2002, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't like using numbers um, from outside of our particular market just because we all have our own micro markets. What happens in Arizona definitely may not reflect what's gonna happen in Northwest Indiana or what's gonna happen in the South suburbs of, of Chicago or California. <clears throat> there could be parts of California that get crushed. Costa Mesa might still do well because why? Uh, because there's a, a maybe a new jobs opening up. Uh, th there's a number of reasons that people still wanna buy. Those are the people you want to focus, focus on. And I'm going to go into some details later as to some of the tactics that I used to try and find buyers, um, basically being a creeper. But uh, there, there's, <laughs> there, there, there's ways, you know. Uh, there, there's things that I, I, there were other options too, but the ones that I focused on, uh, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to discuss um, towards the end of, the, uh, end of this, this session. So when you, um, when, when you have the positive mindset, again, you, you let off a positive energy and know that it's true that maybe not as many houses are selling, but there's always houses selling. And, and I'm talking ahead of myself, so I'm trying to catch up on, my, on, the, on the, the PDF. Um, I already mentioned, you want to listen to your buyers and everything that they have to say, what they're looking for. Um, you want to talk about pricing. So that is that is what's going to show off your expertise because if you know that um, and I'm going to use you know for, from our local local market perspective, um, if you know in Hammond that there's certain areas that sell better than other areas, maybe you 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 hyper focus on those areas and you say, all right, I know that if a house in this particular area comes up on the market under, let's just say a hundred thousand dollars, I know that's a screaming deal because everything out there selling in that neighborhood is, is 120. So maybe you set up for your own education, set up your own search. I've done that on the MLS for myself. I've got certain areas set up in the MLS that when they pop up, I know that that's a deal because I priced, I, I set up the price, I set up the number of bedrooms, set up the number of bathrooms. If a three bedroom bath and a half comes up in 46324 priced under $100,000, I know that's a pretty good deal, even if it needs work. because. You're looking at houses that typically sell 135 to you know 190. So it's a good thing for your own knowledge because when you know the market, you don't have to sit there and look at a book or look at the MLS while you're talking to somebody. You can already tell them, hey, if we can find you something in these areas that we're talking about, I'm already knowing ahead of time that this is going to be a solid investment for you. Um, this kind of talks about listings. I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip over that and get to the next section. Okay. Um, you know, one thing that, that uh, Alex touched on is, you know, finding the buyer's motivation and whether or not that motivation is going to change. And what are some of the things that, that makes that motivation, right? Um, so we're trying to, we're trying to establish um, we're, we're trying to establish urgency. And by creating that best buy list is the number one way that, that you can go about. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to see where, all right, this price and condition. Um, creating urgency, the best way to do that is to create that best buy list and to attract buyers to that. Man, we've got social media. In, in 2008, 2009, 2010, I mean, Facebook just started what, I think in 2010, um, it was much different than it is today, won't you? I'm sure you guys can all agree with that. But, you know, creating these ads through command that cost nearly nothing um, to throw something out there and say, hey, um, join, my, join my exclusive best buy list. 
Um, you know, you throw that out there and you're creating value. You're creating something that other people aren't necessarily offering just because everyone in the world has access to the MLS or has access to, to Zillow or any other website. It doesn't necessarily mean they know what the best deals are. They might know an, a price range in a particular area, but you're already taking out the work and showing them, hey, I am the professional. I am the expert on my marketplace. And this is why you should come to me and work with me. We, we know that the name of the game in real estate is listings, right? We want listings. If sellers, um, if, if sellers are out there and you're taking listings, great. But if they're not selling, that's not helping you. So that's when we have to shift. Once again, we have to shift our, our business and our mindset to make sure that we're also attracting buyers. Because if you've got listings and they're just sitting there, um, that's not helping anybody. Okay. Um, you know, this is a, a little pricing graph. We're talking about houses that are um, in a seller's market, how things sell versus in a buyer's market, how things sell. So in a, in a, a buyer's market, the houses that are in excellent condition or great condition and priced at or below market value are the ones that are going to sell and they're always going to sell. So uh, those are the ones that you want to concentrate on. Those are the ones that you want to show your buyers because those are going to be the best deals that are going to be available to them. That's that little tip there. So, you know, there's other things to consider when, when you're working with a buyer. And again, you know, uh, figuring out that sense of urgency and understanding what it is. So understanding buyer urgency is, is one of the most important things in a shifting market. And you want to concentrate on buyers that are ready, willing, and able. I want to repeat that. And I'm going to reverse it. Able, ready, and willing. Okay? Because there's other buyers, and those are the ones that are able and ready, but they're waiting. What are they waiting for? They're waiting for prices to come down more. They're waiting for the next house that's going to come up that's going to fit their criteria. There's a lot of things that they might be waiting for, but those are guys that are just going around from car dealership to car dealership, kicking tires. And you don't necessarily want to lose those buyers because they may buy at some point, but you definitely don't want to waste a lot of time showing them houses if they're not ready to make a move. The ones that you want to be able to get, to get with are the ones that obviously you have to make sure that they're financially capable of buying a house. That's number first and foremost, sit down, get the pre-approval, that's number two, right? Number one is, is the buyer consultation. Number two, get them with, a, with, with a, a lender, your lender of choice, their lender of choice, whoever it is, make sure that you also have good communication with that lender. Um, you know, buyer says one thing, lender says something else. It just helps to keep everybody <clears throat> on the same page. <clears throat> so that's the financial capacity of, of them. The motivation the motivating factor of why they want to buy and that is something that you need to highlight and asterisk because you can keep referring back to that particular thing why are they want why do they want to buy is it because they're living in an apartment and a lease is coming up that's a pretty strong motivating factor because you know that they are on a time for time limit if their lease expires in june or in july and you know we're in april you know that they have 45 days basically 60 days to get into a house, get something under contract, and, and, and they're going to buy something. Uh, you know, someone who has, has a job change. That job change may require them to move closer to work, um, or they just may want to move closer to work or closer to the highway to have um, easier access. Maybe they had a kid and they're living in a two-bedroom and they need to upgrade. Those are things that you want to make sure that besides the buyer consultation, that you write very good notes about those buyer's wants and needs, and especially the needs. And again, that way you can keep going back to that urgency, and you're not trying to push them to do something that they don't want to do, but you're helping them make the decision. And that way, when that best buy does come up and it checks the boxes, you're not sitting there saying, let's wait till tomorrow. Let's sleep on it. Because if they sleep on it, they may not get to sleep in it. Bill, I, I want to throw some in on that too, you know, just to reinforce what you said about, about going deeper on their why. I mean, when you're talking about their reasons for moving and their urgency, 
um, you've got to get down to to really why it is that that they want to buy. And I, I think eventually it's going to come down to an emotional thing, like a feeling, right? I want to yeah. feel like I own a home or it's going to come, it's going to get to that. And until you get to that, you probably haven't found it. Um, the, um, you use the example of someone's lease ending. Uh, I was just on the phone. Uh, I think it's a couple of different people the last couple of days of conversations where we're talking about a buyer's lease ending, but you know, Bill, I, you're a landlord. So am I, um, I might let a tenant go over their lease right now because I'm not excited about, um, you know, right. kicking them yeah. out and finding a new tenant. Right. Sure. So, so even if their lease is ending, the next question is, and have you already asked your landlord about extending that or going to month to month? Do they have another tenant lined up? What's it going to cost? Right. Is cause, cause at some point they're going to think of that and they're going to ask them and you might not know about that conversation. And suddenly what you thought was an emergency isn't. And they go, yeah, we actually, we just, you know, we got another six month extension. You're like, ah, right. <laughs> Which is fine. Maybe they'll still buy, but probably six months from now. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And it's happened to me in the past too. All sure. All the information. Don't just stop at my lease expires this month. Great. All right. You know, I can keep going because that's what I want to do. Yeah. Right? It's just go. Yes. And like, I want to, that's a, that's an A plus buyer, but just ask a few more questions. Really dig a little bit deeper on their Dig, dig deep. You're deep. right. You're right, Alex, and, and that's that's one thing that that you know you can't ask too many questions, right? Um, because just like Alex touched on, you you want to you want to get deep into their psyche, and 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 again, when I say get into their psyche, I'm not trying to say that you're trying to convince them to do something that they don't want to do. You want to come off as a servant. You want to con continuously uh, look out for their best interests. I mean, that's that's what we do. As, as uh, that's what good agents do. We always are looking out for our for our clients' best interests, and that's how it should be. Yeah, you you to interrupt real quick. I mean, yeah. Alex is one hundred percent on. You have yes. to ask tough questions. So, what's it mean to you? What's it yes. going to do for your family to be here? What happens? What happens if this if you don't if you don't get this home? Right. You you. It all comes down to not being attached to the outcome, even though a lot of times we are. But you got to be able to take the conversation there and ask those tough questions, and do it sooner than later. Um, to piggyback on bills, I mean, I, we were driving buyers around in 2008 when gas was $6 a gallon and prices were dropping and so were rates and creating buyers, buyer urgency in that market was a challenge. Sure. A real challenge. It's like, why should I buy it today? It's going to be 20 grand less tomorrow. And the interest rates are dropping too. Um, you know, so I, I think moving forward, the rates are doing nothing but go up or, you know, or at least steady. They're not going to drop them like they did in the mortgage meltdown. Um, and, and, you know, unfortunately, gas isn't going to be $6 a gallon, hopefully. Uh, but, you know, I mean, so, so you have to be able to ask those tough questions just so that way you can find out who you're dealing with. Because the want to's, no. Absolutely. Like if someone says, I want to buy a house so I can get a pool. They're probably, they're, like Alex said, they're probably going to waste a lot of time. Yeah. yeah and, and that's exactly right. You, you definitely need to, that want yeah. If they're a family of three living in a two bedroom condo and mama's eight months pregnant. Yeah. We have that contract right now. It was a family of five <laughs> yeah. in a two bed condo. Yeah. It was the quarantine that forced them. Out. Yeah, yeah. The quarantine made them need to buy because the mom was like, I'm losing it. We got to get the heck out of here. And they, they're buying a house right now. Yep. So <laughs> I mean, that's motivation. If I, were you, if I were you guys, I would start targeting two bedroom condos and start looking for the specifically the ones that have a bunch of, kids toys in the little patio so all right so, so i i, I want to touch on that mark because you brought that up and i mentioned earlier that that i was going to share some of the tactics that i used when i was a newer agent um and, and like i said i mean some of it i mean it wasn't really creepy i, I guess I, people probably wondered how the hell i figured out that they just had a kid but i would um i, I looked at the newspapers and i looked up you know birthing announcements and then I, I, that is sly, my friend. And then I, I cross-referenced last names and I sent to the, to, to the parents on both sides, assuming that they were probably, um, you know, still living at home. Now things have changed. People get, you know, people, you know, live together and, and have a baby without being married. And anyway, but um, I, I did, I created postcards and I sent out to the parents on both sides, congratulating on the, them on the new addition to their family. Um, and I, I put a little blurb in there about, um, you know, running out of space and, um, you know, maybe now's the time to, you know, increase that space. I, I'd have to dig in to find one of my old postcards. It's been 
it's been a minute, you know, since I sent something out, out like that. But um, I, I, I just thought that was a great source of knowing whose family is getting bigger, right? I think the point in it is be creative and yeah. think outside the box. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it was, you know, it was fun. Um, I think I got one or two deals out of it, you know, which, you know, I mean, it was one or two deals that I didn't have. I'm not going to lie. It was a lot of work. Um, I, I had to do a lot of research to get the, that list, but, you know, it, it worked out. And I want to say that I still have a few of those people in my sphere. So it, it definitely wasn't wasn't a, a total lost cause. Yeah, you can also take a look at all the two-bedroom or three-bedroom, 1,000-square-foot homes that have sold in the last three years um, in areas that you want to farm to and do the exact same thing because you figure most people who bought starter homes with two- and three-bedroom <clears throat> houses under 1,000 square feet are going to be looking to offload those and get out, especially if they've been locked in for the last 30 plus days in a less than thousand square foot home. And you're assuming that within that three, three year period of time, they probably put some more population in there besides one person. Yeah. And you know, put some um, more population in there. <laughs> right. <laughs> the census says, <laughs> right, right. And, and David, that that's awesome that you brought that up um, because, you know, sometimes when you're working with a buyer that, that did buy that thousand square foot house and, you know, had limited funds to, to, you know, do it. And now they're like, well, I'm going to sell my house and I'm not going to get as much as I was hoping to get. You know, if you say that, the, that the average across the market drop in prices ends up being 5%, if it happens at 5%, um, one thing to counter that, that negativity is to say, listen, that 5% drop on your hundred thousand dollar house only equates to $5,000. But now you're telling me you want to buy a 220. That's eleven thousand dollar discount. So you're actually netting yourself six grand by upgrading. And what's going to end up happening is in five years, seven years, ten years, when you're going to sell that house, the same, uh, the the same percentage, but opposite is going to probably uh, um, benefit you. So that hundred thousand dollar house in ten years might only be worth one ten, but your 220 is now worth 245. Right, so it's just one way to to counter somebody who, especially like 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 David just mentioned, um, is afraid that they said, yeah, I, you know, we are running out of space. We want a bigger house, but we're gonna we feel now we're gonna take a loss on this house. Um, they're not gonna take a loss in all likelihood, but that equity that they that they're giving up, they're gonna gain it right back on the on the next purchase. And that's um, that that's a strong sales tactic to um you know to include and it's not again it's not trying to sell them on something that isn't true you can show them the numbers on something like that you know you we still have access to things that sold in 2008 i bought my house in 2012 and i mean we were fortunate when we that we bought when we bought because it was right when we were coming out of the market did i time it no i didn't time it i got lucky and and that's Another thing is that, you know, a lot of buyers, they're going to try and time the market, um, you know, try and time any market, whether it's real estate or the stock market, you don't know where the top is and you don't know where the bottom is until you've got hindsight. We might be having a conversation six months from now and be like, man, remember when Bill was worried that that, that prices were going to drop 5% or 10%, man, we've experienced another 5% or 10% increase, you know, so it's definitely not something that we can 100% say that. It, it, you know, there's, there's going to be a down market and that they're going to take a loss on anything. Um, not without looking, you know, that, 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 uh, crystal ball. So, um, you know, we want to make sure when you're working with these buyers and to continue to, to create that buyer urgency, and we shouldn't even have to say this, but it's constant communication. It's a phone call and it's not once a month. Obviously, if you're working with a serious buyer, and you're only contacting them once a month, you obviously are not gonna, gonna have that buyer for very long. So it's every couple of days, it might be every day. Um, it's gonna be something that you're gonna establish between you and them. Um, it's knowing what the best loan programs are. Educate yourself on, on what loans are out there, whether it's an FHA or, or whether if it's USDA in certain markets, that's gonna be the most beneficial to your clients. And that's the important thing about partnering yourself up with, uh, with, with an excellent, and, I, and when I say excellent, I mean excellent. Not your best friend who happens to do loans. You have to partner yourself up 
with the best loan officers that are out there, the most knowledgeable that can get things done, that know how to work with uh, a buyer's income, how to show expenses or not show expenses without obviously, um, you know, creating um, uh, mortgage fraud, <laughs> of course, <laughs> without <laughs> fracturing the law. Exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, Bill, and that's a great point to, to lean on that, right? So, I mean, one way you can create buyer urgency instantly right now is that mortgage guidelines are changing like multiple times a day. Yes. And, and that the pool of money is being dried up because mortgage companies are having to face the reality that they're going to, like 3 million people have applied for forbearances. And so, you know, we're going to get more about you, financing on you, Friday. Yeah. So it's like with, with that regard though, it's like, you know, that's a way to create buyer age urgency is that, yeah, you qualified for 700 or, you know, 700,000 last week. And now that rates have gone up because they're gouging you because the, the supply of money is down. Now you're only qualified for 600. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, unless you're paying cash, you can wait for the market to go down, but the rate's going to affect your payment more than the damn purchase price. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's exactly right. Um, I can't remember the stats off the top of my head, but it's, it's something like, you know, 1% on a hundred thousand dollar, you know, 1% interest rate bump up on, on even a hundred thousand dollar sale is something like $87, I think a month. Um, it might be a little bit more than that. I'd have to actually do the math, but um, you know, you say, well, 87 bucks a month isn't a lot, but for someone who's got a $500 payment and all of a sudden it's 600, um, it, it, it is a lot actually. I mean, that's groceries for the month, that's gas, that's, that's you know, whether or not they're going to eat out um, or have that Starbucks coffee. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that, that, that come into play when you talk about that 1%. It's more than just 1%. So, um, all right. So again, you know, when, when we're talking about overcome buyer's fears, um, you know, and, and being supportive, the best thing that you can do is give them expert advice. Always look out for your client's best interest. And they will stick with you. They'll stick with you today. And then when they go to sell their house in three years and five years and 10 years, whenever it is, they're going to call you. And then you know what? Their kids are going to call you too. And their cousins are going to call you and their aunts and uncles and everybody they know is going to call you because you did not try to push them into something that they didn't want to do. All you did was knew what you were talking about. You walked them through it. You knew the market and you were an expert in the marketplace. It's all about education. And this is what we're doing right now, right? We're educating ourselves with how to work with buyers, how to create the urgency without being coming off as a salesperson, coming off as a servant. I love that term. I, I love that, that uh, KW is all about being a servant to our clients. Mm. So I, I'm checking the chat box just in case someone had some questions. Okay. Um, Buyers are going to need professional advice. They need professional advice in any market. That's why we. That's why we're here to give them professional advice. We know the contracts. We should know contracts, purchase agreements. Um, so it's our duty to make sure that we also educate our buyers and um, let them know, without coming off as cocky, that we are the experts and that we do know what we're talking about. What, you know, some, some of the reluctance that you come across is the buyer is all happy and excited um, and then they go home and they start talking to their family members and their friends and everybody is, all of a sudden everyone's a real estate professional, right? They say, oh, why would you buy in this market? Why would you do this? Why would you do that? Um, you know, there's going to be something better that might come back on, that's going to come back on the market. Um, there's something cheaper that's going to come on the market. I mean, that may or may not be true. One of the best conversations you can have with your, with your people, and, and I already kind of mention this is when you do find that house that hits all those checklists sit down with them in that house go over that checklist with them and mm. explain to them hey this is what your wants were this is what your needs are how does that house compare to that checklist and they say well gosh it's got the three bedrooms it's got the two bathrooms it's got the basement it's in the school district that i want to be in or the subdivision that i wanted to be in it's down the street from the park. So what is there to think about? What were to happen? Because if you like this house, right? If you like this house, the next person I like that walks into this house is probably also going to like it. And most likely it's going to be for the same reasons that you like it. So what happens if you go home tonight to sleep on it 
And then you find out the next morning that that house sold because the next person that walked in there did not hesitate. How would that make you feel? And Mark brought that up. How is that going to make you feel if you lost that house? I mean, are you going to care? I mean, if you don't care, then, then you have to reevaluate what their motivations are. I find the word regret to be really powerful. Yeah. Will you regret it? Yep. Right. People uh, that tends to dig kind of deep. So use that word uh, to, to, to enforce the <clears throat> concepts of pain and pleasure. Right. So, um, you know, you also have to, um, you have to account for their expectations. So, you know, sometimes people hear, well, it's a buyer's market. So a house is listed for $200,000. I should be able to get it for a hundred. Um, yeah, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to rain on their parade. Um, you know, but you also, again, that's where your market knowledge comes into play and showing them the, the stats. So when you have something to back it up and, and it's very simple, you just pull up the MLS and you, and you say, all right, I'm going to pull up this neighborhood and I'm going to show you what the list price to sale price ratio is and what the average days on the market is for that particular area. And you tell me what, what you, where you would price this house. When I flip that around like that and ask the buyer, where would you price this house? That's also very powerful because then they make the decision in their own mind that, holy crap, the market here sells between one hundred and one hundred thirty thousand dollars for lifetime house, like for like houses. This one's priced at one ten, but the condition blows away the ones that are priced at one hundred. I need to jump on this house. That's how you create urgency. That's how you show them that in every market, there's good opportunities. That's brilliant. Um, and it, it comes, it, it goes along with giving perspective. You know, give them perspective on, on historical prices. Tell them what your parents paid for their house. Tell them what your aunt paid for her house that's been in there for 25 or 30 years or even 15 years. When you start hearing, I mean, you know, I, I bought my first property um, in uh, 98. I bought my second one in 2003. If I had the same mindset today that I had, if I could have had the same mindset then that I have now, I would have bought three houses. I mean, it's ridiculous most pretty much anything that you bought 20 years ago has doubled in price or more in almost every market. So, I mean, if you can show people that, of course, you always have to say that disclaimer that, you know, there's no promise or guarantee of what's going to happen in the future. But if you look at historical prices and you say, man, my parents paid $40,000 for their house 40 years ago, and it's now worth 200. 20 years ago, I paid 130,000 for my house and it's now worth 220. You can start to show the trend. You can show them that baseline, just like you can show them a stock market chart and show them what the S&P 500 has done over the last 40 years, last 20 years, last 10 years. Are there hiccups along the way? There has to be, whatever goes up has to come down at some point. But what you typically will see is that that down spike is nowhere near how much that up spike was. So if you went some, got something that went from 50 to 100 and adjusted back down to 80, that next up spike is probably gonna be 120. Maybe that down spike might be 110. That next up, up spike is gonna be 130 or 140 or 150. The market that we're in now, it could be 220 or 250. Um, so yeah, there's, there's long-term, if someone's gonna be in their house for 10 years, what they pay, paid for today is most likely not going to matter too, too much. So giving that historical perspective also kind of helps to um, support what you're telling them. You also want to set the expectations. So if they do think that they're going to get that house for free, um, you know, you, again, that goes back to showing them the statistics, showing them what the average market price is um, for, and, and be as tight as possible with those comps and show them that list, list price to sale price ratio. And that, that's really powerful. That's strong because they can see it on numbers, depending on, on who the client is. Um, you know, some are more analytical than others, uh, but it's, it's definitely super strong to be able to back up what you're telling them with numbers. So any advice you give them, you want to make sure that it's research-based and not just your opinion. Uh, 
Can I just share a real quick tip? Please uh, do, Mark. Before I forget it because I'm yeah. so uh, One of the things I've done, and I don't work historically with a lot of buyers, but when I do get a buyer into escrow, I remove them from the auto search and the MLS. Yeah. So we stop with the uh, the grass is always greener. Sure. They can still find info on Zillow and Truly and all the other spots, but that's the one thing I, I make sure it's a common practice. Like their auto search and the MLS gets shut off right away. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you. So <clears throat> I I I've always worked. I mean I've always been about fifty fifty, but I always put a lot more time into my buyers because other agents would tell me that. This is the way that they would do it. They would set up an auto search and set it up and let it go. I would do an auto search, but I didn't automatically share that information with my clients. I actually dug through the MLS and I would handpick the ones that I was going to send to them. Now, was there an occasion where that buyer called me and said, hey, there was a house that came on the market, but I didn't see you send it to me? Absolutely more than once. Um, but and, but I, I would always back that up. Hey, you know what? I did see that property. The reason I didn't send it to you was because A, it was next to the railroad tracks or B, um, based off of the subdivision or the neighborhood or the town that it was in, it didn't fit, match the criteria that we discussed. Um, always knowing um, that you've got their interests at heart, right? Again, it, it all comes back to serving them and servicing them. The, um, you know, digging into, into their psychology, again, you know, why they want to buy a house, what's going to change if they don't buy that house. Those are all strong things, you know, and, and you know, differentiate, differentiating what their wants are, what their needs are, um, and making sure that they don't feel like you're manipulate, manipulating them. You know, you can overcome their reluctance because in every market, buyers can be reluctant. Even as in the strongest seller's market, when houses are selling the same minute basically they're getting listed um buyers are out there writing offers sight unseen sometimes because they may not have the opportunity to even get in it uh, overcoming reluctance though is going to the way that you do overcome that reluctance again is showing them their why reiterating the why this is what it is that that you said you needed why you needed it and i'm here to, to give you that on a silver plate basically uh, I had agents when I was at Berkshire, I had, because of the, the amount of studying that I did of houses on the MLS, um, knowing the inventory, whether I was in that house or not, I could almost give you a, a, an example, uh, um, details of that house, the price, the neighborhood, because that's what I did. And I still do it, not to the extent, because I don't have as much time as I used to have to do that, but the extent of research that I did, there was an agent in my office who would say, you know what, I was just about to look for a property in the MLS, but I thought I'd ask you first, <laughs> you know, because that's how well I knew the market at the time. She's like, you just amazed me at the amount of details that you remember about the properties. That's what you want to try to do for your buyers so that when you talk about properties, you, it, it, just, it just rolls off the tongue. You can talk about the neighborhood. You can talk about the houses that are on that block. That's what you want to come off as. And that's how you come off as, as the true expert and the true professional that we are. I guess I caught myself up here there. So that, that, that worked out pretty well. Um, you know, so if we do come into a buyer's market, um, typically you're not, there's not as huge a rush as far as getting into the house. There's still urgency to get into the house, but what might happen is the buyer says, I can't get into it, you know, until the weekend. Um, there's the fear factor has left a little bit. You don't want that fear factor to leave though. You still need to make sure that you um, present them with the mindset that, Hey, even though it's a buyer's market um, and houses do tend to stay on the market a little bit longer, the good ones are still selling fast. One way you can you can present that to them is say, look, if you can't make it today, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna schedule a showing for myself. I'm gonna walk through that house. And if I strongly feel like it's something that we should go look at, I'll reschedule for us to come back tonight when you get off of work, if I feel that strongly about it. You might work a little bit harder, but again, you're building up that loyalty. You're building up that um, camaraderie, right? And the rapport that you wanna have with your clients.
Um, I already talked about creating the best buy list. I'm, I'm sure you guys understand, you know, what, what that is. Um, another thing that you want to discuss is the advantages of home ownership. Someone who, who rents an apartment doesn't really understand. All they know is that I don't have to worry about nothing. I pay my rent every month and on the weekends I'm watching TV. I'm playing Xbox. I'm not mowing lawn. I'm not fixing water heaters. I'm not doing nothing. I'm just chilling. Right. As landlords, that rarely happens for us. And that's the negative side of it, right? But what's the positive? You buy a house, you're building up equity, you are gonna have something down the road. You know, in America, that is one of the greatest wealth creators is creation is home ownership. The benefits of home ownership, you get a property tax deduction. You, you're writing off your, your interest on your, um, on your, your payment. Um, so all that interest that you're paying, yeah, it sucks, but at least it's deductible against your income. A tenant doesn't get to do that. A tenant doesn't get to write off the property taxes. A tenant doesn't get to write off a lot of things that a homeowner does get to do. The biggest thing is the equity. So every month that that house, because eventually those values are gonna start increasing again, every month that you're making that payment, not it, it's twofold because number one, you're reducing your, your balance on it. And number two, that property value is creeping up. So every month you have a small shift and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And the next thing you know, 15 years, 20 years down the road, and you're like, man, I've got a couple hundred thousand dollars sitting in a house. I sell it today and I can buy a bigger house. I can do a ton of things with it. <clears throat> you might retire, whatever it is. Being able to show them what the benefits are of home ownership, that's strong. From that perspective, maybe you talk to your accountant and say, hey, can you give me like a little sheet that shows what the tax benefits are of home ownership? Include that in your buyer consultation. You can refer back, that, back to that and show them, hey, I understand that you feel that, that it's not the best time to buy because of what's going on, but who's to promise you that we're not gonna have hyperinflation in six months and interest rates go from three and a half percent to 6% overnight? Who's to say that, that the market doesn't change in six months and all of a sudden you thought you caught the bottom, but houses start flying out, out, out the door like crazy and you missed that opportunity. So there truly is no better time to buy real estate than today. I like to tell buyers, you're already paying a mortgage. It's either you're paying your landlord's mortgage or you're paying your own. Absolutely, man. That's, that's strong, especially when they're renting, right? Um, we already talked about creating a Best Buy list. Uh, so this is a, a, a pretty cool chart as far as where to find those Best Buys, right? Um, and not, not because, look, foreclosures are not always a great deal. And they're not for everybody. Um, I mean, obviously, they've got REOs, number one. Um, can you get some equity out of an REO? Absolutely. If you're not handy, though, the, the cost of the repairs may not be aligned with where you want to be. Right. So... Um, am I up for an REO? Absolutely. I'd I buy a foreclosure tomorrow. I would buy um, a, an estate sale. The, the, house that I, the house that I'm in now, gosh, I, I should pull up some pictures so you can just see the, what, what it looked like. And when I brought my wife into this house, she's like, you're nuts. Um, what I did with the house in, the, in the, the next seven months though, it was a total transformation. Um, looking at it now and looking at it then, people are in awe. But it took some money. It took some sweat equity and it took some time. But from a pricing perspective, this is a good way to look at things like that. You look at your FISBOs that aren't working with, with an agent and they might be struggling a little bit uh, because they, the reason that they didn't hire a realtor in the first place is because they were afraid that they were gonna give up all their whatever equity they had left. Hit those people up, call them, I've got a buyer. And right now there's nothing on the market that on the MLS that's being actively marketed that matches their criteria, but I think your house does. Don't lie to these people, tell them the truth. And what happens? <clears throat> a lot of times you take that FISBO and you sold their listing and guess what? They need to buy something too. They've already built, established some type of relationship with you. So now you're double backing it. You're selling their house and now you're working with them on the, on the backside. Price reductions, <coughs> excuse me. Price reductions give you a great, great, 
idea of who's motivated to sell. Look at that, look at the pricing history of a house. Go back and see. If they reduce their price after a week or after two weeks, and it was a $5,000 price cut, and they need another $5,000 price cut, you got a buyer that's motivated, or seller that's, that's motivated. Those are the types of properties you want to put on your best buy list and explain to your, to your buyers what it is about that house, why it is a best buy, if it doesn't necessarily hit their, every one of their, their needs and wants, if it's just because of the price and the area. Um, I have veered outside of what my buyers told me that they wanted because I came across a property that to me was just a smoking deal. And I saw that and I saw it as an opportunity and I shared that with my clients. They said, hey, you know what? I wasn't really looking at Crown Point, but man, you showed me this house and now I'm strongly considering it even though it's an additional 15 minute drive. But I saw the value there. And that's what you want to look at. You want to present that value to create that buyer urgency. Because again, you are finding properties that other people aren't necessarily finding because you're doing the research for them. Um, you know, builders promotions. So, you know, when we get into a buyer's market, um, you know, there a lot of builders, you know, they start throwing all types of things. They start throwing closing costs out there. Um, they start throwing appliance packages, upgrades, because they want to move their inventory. Um, you know, no matter what happens, I have a strong suspicion that over the 30 to 60 days coming up that builders are going to start throwing in some, some, some sweet deals just to make sure that they're not sitting on inventory like they were in 2009. In 2010, there was a builder that um, left a car. It was a brand new car. It was like a Honda Civic or something like that. Brand new to get their houses sold left it in the garage for their buyers. Now, are we gonna to come to that? I sure as hell hope not, but those are some things that, you know, when we talk about builder promotions, that's crazy. <coughs> um, again, reiterate the fact to them that good houses sell fast in any market. If something's priced under the market, do your homework. Um, Again, this is on us. This is on us to show them why this particular house, maybe not every house, but why this particular house should be on your, on the buy list and why you create urgency for these particular properties. Um, okay, so the, 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 I, I, there were some scenarios as far as interest rates and, you know, talks about an, a home price of $200,000, interest rate 6%. A payment is eleven ninety nine. Even if prices go down by five percent and interest rate goes up a half percent, that is a wash. There's a two dollar difference between, um, you know, that that um, raise in the interest rate and the, the dedu deduction in the um, cost of the house. But what you're trying to show them is that for them to have any savings, that price, the price of the house on a monthly basis, has to come down su substantially, because you need something around ten to twenty thousand dollars to really make a huge difference. If you break down what a what a what a house payment is, and you're talking a difference between a hundred and a hundred ten thousand dollars, that's literally something like forty five dollars a month. It's not a lot of money, and and that's pretty much in any budget. Forty five bucks a month is pretty easy to 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 to, to skim. I mean, as a market center, we managed to do quite a bit more than that, and and we acted quickly on that. Um, I mean, it's it's amazing that when you put a bunch of minds together, um, how, how you can uh, adjust to the shift. I talked about that trade up market and, and that's, that's really strong to me showing them that if they, even if they're, they're taking a 5% loss on their hundred thousand dollar house, that $200,000 house is taking a $10,000 hit and they're going to position themselves for an increase way more than what they'll see in that lower end house. Um, you know, again, you know, the best buy list, I, I can't harp on that enough. One thing that, that wasn't on the list that they had is Craigslist. Um, I see opportunities all the time on Craigslist, you know, uh, maybe even reaching out to wholesalers, talk to your wholesalers, see if they're willing to do something because they're probably not, you know, it's not just going to be the, the retail market that will be affected if there's a downturn, it's going to be these wholesalers too, and they want to stay in business. So they may be a little bit more 
apt to work with you as an agent and not just to sell the house as a wholesale opportunity, but they've already got a crew in place. So they might have a house that that's a pig, but um, by them putting their crew in there, it's helping them out because they're moving their inventory. It's helping your buyer out because now they're getting an updated house and it's, they're, and they're still staying within the range. And it's a house that nobody even else got, got to even see yet. The biggest thing is oh. use your list. Look every day. I mean, even twice a day. If you look in the morning, look again in the afternoon at what, at what you um, listings have come up on the, on, on the MLS. Go ahead, Alex. I was just going to say, you know, in, in Ubaldo's session and in my session, we talked about having these, uh, make an offer for immediate response. And we talked about having something of value. And this was one of the items that was on there is to have a, like a best buy list or a list of secret homes or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, so this, I just I'm tying those pieces together. Remember, if you have this, you can use this for lead generation and you can make this the thing that people <clears throat> give you their contact information in order to get. So yeah, um, this, you know, it serves a dual purpose. Sure. And I'm, we're, we're pretty much wrapping things up, at least for, the, for, for this chapter. Um, a couple things that I just wanted to, to definitely um, make sure that I brought up is that the way that you're going to build leadership, and, I, and I'm going to keep harping on this, the way that you, that you you build that urgency is by you, your knowledge of the market. It's not about anybody else. It's about your knowledge of the market. Because when you can present something in a manner that is beneficial to the buyers that they understand how and why you came up with that conclusion and you have to shift your own mindset that that that's as powerful as you can get and again you know we're not trying to push somebody into doing something that they don't want to do but it's definitely making sure that you've got that buyer consultation down pat that you dig deep into that why you know like with this script talking about what exactly do you mean by a large kitchen? What does that mean? Big enough for a table of 10 or just for a round table? No, I just want something where I can put a little square table in it. You know what I mean? So there's questions that you want to dig deep into when they start answering your initial questions, follow that up with another question and with another question and with another question and make sure that you've got every detail that you can down on that list. Okay. Um, we talked about who, who and when people are motivated and why. Um, you know, again, who to look for specifically. When we get to that point, you know, uh, reaching out to, to uh, apartment complexes is a great place to start. Sending everybody a letter. It doesn't even have to have their name on it. Just send general letters out. Hey, um, you know, and, and give them a graph. Send a little graph with it with your business card, showing them what their rent or what the average rent is in their market. And on a $200,000 house or whatever your average market price is, show them what the difference is between renting versus owning. Show them a 10-year graph, where they would be in 10 years if they continued to rent. Those are ways to get people off the fence. Um, I'm, I'm going to open it up for questions. Is there anybody that... Uh, has any specific questions about about maintaining and creating buyer urgency? How do you I, how do you get the addresses for the apartment complexes? So Donna, I did it the old fashioned way. I drove around and um, figured out. I mean, there's there's multiple ways to do it. Um, there we we do have access to some things, um, CoreLogic specifically. And you can sit down with one of the title reps. Um, I don't know if, if you want to sit down with Christine uh, from Fidelity, and she can help with that. Okay. It's like a it's it's like a penny and aim. Yeah, I know it's not much. It's super cheap. Yeah, it's super cheap. She can give you login information where you, you know you you can use her the first time or you can use her continuously. One of the processors in the office will actually, if you give them the account information, put twenty bucks in the account. And they'll come up with the list for you. They'll even mail it out for you. There's, there's things that you can do <clears throat> that all you have to do is get the ball rolling. And they'll take it from there. You tell them, this is what I want to do. They will help you. Okay. Christine Banter is extremely helpful with things like that. So it's a good place to start. Okay, thank you, Bill. Sure. Also, um, 
if you, if you guys have Remind, like we have in Illinois through MRED, uh, you'll get all those addresses right from Remind, get all those, you know, label format and everything. So there's awesome. different ways to do that. Yeah, you know what, Yvaldo, thanks for bringing that up because um, our MLS, I believe, recently implemented Remind. I haven't played with it, though. It's fantastic. Uh, I'm going to be doing a Remind class for the Elite Office uh, through the MRED system. Um, Remind is pretty much the same in every region, just a little few different things that we might get for free through MRED. But if okay. you guys want to join, let me know. I'll pass the info along. I, I'm going to tell you right now, yes. Fantastic. Baldo, I, I, this is Liz, and I took a um, Remind class through Ganayar last summer. It's mm -hmm. awesome. You awesome. get all this information for free. And there's a higher level that you could pay for, but it's come in very handy. Yeah, and, uh, we're spoiled in Illinois because MRED actually chose Remind as their public uh, uh, public record of choice. So as of July of last year, we get all the bells and whistles for free. Um, so it just depends. Like, like I said, I mean, I could show you all the bells and whistles of Remind. Um, different MLSs charge different levels, but it's so sweet. You know, if you could get, you could pull out searches, there's a limitation, but you get all that information basically for free. It's, it's a real sweet system if you get, if you put the time into learning it. Uh, you, there's so much information there. I mean, at some levels, you could even get phone numbers and, and names and emails. So um, it's worth looking into it. So also, so one I've of the got, things- I've, I'm checking it out here in the MLS. Sorry. Um, we have it in Ganayar. It looks yeah. pretty dope. I'm kind of excited. I didn't know that we had this. I'm so glad that if there's one thing that anyone should be writing down in terms of take this nugget away uh, to implement what Bill told you to do and then turn it into a lead gen process, go log into your MLS and find the Remine uh, app link down in the left-hand corner, man. This is awesome. Yeah, so, and like, it's it, it's uh, very easy to use. Uh, there's so much information in there. It, it's, it, the, I mean, every MLS is a little bit different depending on what kind of data sharing platforms they have or agreements they have with Remind. But if they have a good a relationship with your MLS, it's super, super powerful. One of the things I did when I, I stepped away from, I stepped into a coaching program that was all about lead capture before it was like prevalent. It was Google pay-per-clicks and stuff like that in 2009, 2010. And because I had such a strong REO uh, portfolio as far as listings go, I started attracting a lot of buyers by registering unique do domains. So it was like Corona foreclosures list.com, you know, stuff like that. Very, very micro specific to a city. So you awesome. do, you know, free, free, free foreclosure list in, you know, whatever. And then you could start broadcasting that on social media. Now that it's, you know, it'd be a lot more cost effective. You could probably create a landing page, and then have it tied to a very unique mm -hmm. micro market for free, free list, you know, foreclosures.com, stuff like this. Start, so start looking at registering those domains now before they become popular in the next six to nine months. Brilliant. Be that's, nice that is brilliant. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, you know, I mean, just personal experience. I, I did take advantage of Craigslist when, when uh, again. It, yeah, I never had any ads on Craigslist too. Yeah. Uh, and and that, that's what I did. I I did exactly what this talks about, what Shift talks about. I just said, you know, free list of uh, foreclosures in your market. I couldn't believe the feedback that I got from that. The number of people that were contacting me, calling me, si sign me up for your list, sign me up for your list. I ended up working with five or six investors. And I'm not saying that I was making a ton of money off of, off of these investors because the reality is, when you work with an investor, you're, you know, you do tend to run around a little bit. You're not going to get every house and, you know, you might make a thousand bucks, but what you're hoping is that they're going to flip it and relist it with you. The nice thing about the investors, the nice thing about investors is that they become an ongoing business because they, as long as, if you get, if you, they, they see you as a good resource. I mean, I have investors I started working with when the market went down, I was doing REO yeah. that they'll call me to this day and say, well, I'll put an offer on this property. They haven't even seen it yet because right. they trust me when I tell them, the property is worth it based on the condition of the house. And I've done so much business with them. And I will sell these investors four, five, six houses sight on scene because if you become the resource and they trust you, they'll just keep giving you business. So, you know, don't be afraid of the investors. Yeah, they're, they make you run around a little bit in the beginning. Yeah. But it could be such a good source of business ongoing. Well, and, and the referrals that I've gotten from some of my investor clients mm -hmm. that, that translated into retail. And one of my investors, you know, they were, they were wealthy. 
Um, her husband's a, 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 an oral surgeon. Um, I ended up listing their house for $645,000, you know? So um, it, I, I got that. I ended up getting that payback. Um, you know, it took some time, but it, it, you, it's always about, you know, again, being willing to serve them. It's good stuff. Yeah. Um, I listen, I don't know if you guys, if you guys have all read, you know, the, the shift book. Um, I know that a leadership has, or is working on it, especially to, to, you know, teach the classes that we're doing. And I want to thank you guys all again for, for being part of this. Um, I, was really, really nervous at the beginning. <laughs> uh, just the anticipation was building up inside of me. And I'm like, gosh, I mean, I do this all the time. I sit in front of people and talk to them all the time. But uh, the, the more uh, feedback that I get, so I really appreciate you, Alex, and Mark, and, and of course, Ubaldo and, and Ruben for jumping in. Of course, David, I hate to leave you out. Um, it makes the class, first of all, much more interesting. And um, it, it helps it flow a lot. So I appreciate you guys. Thank you. You're welcome. my job, Bill. You did amazing, bro. Yeah, you Absolutely. did great. Did a great job, Bill. Thank you for taking Thank time you guys. to do this. Thank you. Thanks Thank for taking you. your time with Thanks, me today. Bill. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys on Friday.